Okay, good evening. We are uh, now go live with our uh, Education Thought Leaders and, Innovate, uh, and Innovators webinar series. My name is Dr. Casey Reason, and I am the host for tonight's event, and I am so excited for those of you who are joining us synchronously or cyber-synchronously at some later point. Uh, we are here tonight to, or to uh, present uh, Beyond Teaching Vocabulary with our guest speaker, Dr. Margarita Calderon and Mr. Sean Slack, who I'll be introducing in a moment. So if we jump ahead to the second slide there, I want to give some credit where credit is due. Uh, this is a really wonderful series. If you have not joined us in the past, the Center for Great Public Schools and the, and the National Education Association have come together, and we have, we have come up with this education thought um, and innovation and innovators series. And what we're thought leaders and innovators series. And what this is about is we get together just about monthly, um, if not more often sometimes, but just about monthly. And uh, we, we present a series of thought leaders, innovators, and authors who are really doing some amazing things in education because the NEA has been working diligently um, since my engagement with them in, in 2013, but even before that in really trying to create learning opportunities for educators across the profession and giving us all a chance to come together in new and unique ways to add value, to grow the profession, to lead in the profession. And it's, it's, um, there's a number of really powerful things that they do. If you ever have a chance to check out the GPA or the, uh, the Center for Great Public Schools, uh, if you ever had a chance to check out, check out Ed Communities, which is down there on that slide below, Ed Communities is the largest collaborative learning space for uh, educators, uh, in the, I believe, in the U.S. We started off with just a few thousand folks, I believe, uh, and, and, and uh, Brandy will always correct me because the number is always low, but uh, I think the number is something like 30,000 active educators. Uh, active and engaged in that collaborative learning space. And if you go on to Ed Communities, you will find fellow educators, you'll find um, uh, resources, you'll find folks who are experts in areas that you really care about as an educator. And what's cool about it is it's free. This is an era where there are services like Teachers Pay Teachers and others, and I'm not in any way disparaging those, but this is, this is a, a service that's free that teachers can find teachers for free, and we just simply want to build thought leadership uh, in the profession by helping teachers find each other and learn to collaborate at a really high level. So the NEA is giving great leadership here in, in accomplishing this task. Um, my association is with the University of Finley. That's where I'm a professor. And um, so, and we've also, I want to thank uh, Solution Tree that uh, has, has helped us this year along with Corwin Press and some others that have been publishers that, that I have worked with in the past that have helped us to, to really bring some really great suggestions on some, some awesome thought leaders like the thought leader that you're going to be meeting tonight. Let's jump to the next slide real quick if we could, uh, Sean, if you're the driving this bus. <laughs> so um, as we go along, uh, just some tips for engagement. Uh, you are, as you're listening, please, please uh, join us. Uh, if you have questions, you can see here that you can pose a question to the speaker as you go. Please mute your microphone. Uh, uh, if you are willing to and are able to, turn on your camera. We'd love to see your smiling face. Uh, raise, you can use the raise your hand feature if you have questions. Uh, you can go back and forth between the full screen and partial screen by looking at those icons there. So it's pretty intuitive. Uh, you might push a, push a button and feel like you've lost, but invariably if you'll, you'll click back and you'll be right back where you were. Um, but stay, do please do stay muted. We can always mute you, but that's the only thing that can become a distraction if somebody is doing dishes in the background when we're trying to present. So we, we try to avoid that because we'd love to have you join us. Next slide. Um, this is, uh, we can go over this really quickly, but part, part of the reason I was involved with the NEA is because I have done so much work in distance learning and so much work in getting teachers to connect with each other in networked spaces. And I share that not to promote my work, but to promote this idea. So again, going back to uh, the GPS network, the Center for Great Public Schools, uh, Ed Communities rather, uh, if you have a chance to join Ed Communities, I think you're gonna see a lot of support out there for teachers finding other teachers in these spaces and allows us to connect. But this is originally how I was connected with the NEA and something that uh, where I've spent a great deal of time with my own scholarship. You can go to the next slide, it's great. 
So I want to introduce to you uh, really two people, and, and uh, I want to, I'm not sure if, um, uh, Sean, if there's, a, if there's a slide for you, I can't remember, but, but, but I want to really quickly, Sean Black is on here as well. He's the Vice President of Operations for uh, Dr. Calderon's uh, company. And uh, he is actually uh, teaming with us here tonight and will be for, is helping steer the, uh, the PowerPoint and, and giving us all support. So thank you, uh, Sean, for being here. And then our guest of honor, author and, and expert and, and really energetic voice uh, uh, in education and, and uh, uh, is Dr. Margarita Calderon. I, I uh, first met her uh, via phone a few months back when we were scheduling this, and we were just so fortunate to have her. She's a very busy presenter, very busy scholar and author, so we're really lucky to have her. And I could tell from, the very, from our very first conversation just what an exciting and authentic and enthusiastic um, presenter she was going to be. And you can see here from, from her, her background here, and she's, she's, if you read up on her, there's, there, are longer, there are tons of longer bios for her that give her a really, if you look at Amazon, she has a, a beautiful bio and, and other spaces too, and her website's on here. But she is a professor uh, emeritus at John Hopkins University. Uh, she's been involved with numerous research projects. Uh, you can see her publications are presented here. Uh, Co-principal investigator, you can see here, uh, on a five-year randomization evaluation for an, uh, for an English uh, immersion uh, transitional bilingual and two-way bilingual elementary uh, program. And I'll let her, I'll let her talk about that and along with um, uh, Sean, or, or along with, uh, within with her presentation, if that's, uh, if that's appropriate. Um, but you can see uh, lots and lots of books here for you to enjoy. And uh, within the GPS network, We'll be offering a link to that. We have an author's page at the end of that that we always, we always, um, uh, we always make make available for you when you come to join when you join us uh, after the presentation. It's the next one there, Sean. Okay, and uh, there's my slide. So you pretty much covered that as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was out of order there, my friend. I apologize. It was Not good to have only. ladies first, and I, I appreciate that. And uh, and uh, and uh, you can see here. Uh, with with uh, publications in his own right, and uh, along with his role with with, with uh, Dr. Calderon's uh, um, company, uh, you can see uh, uh, and, and his smiling faces as well tonight. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Good evening, and welcome to our session beyond teaching vocabulary. Uh, as we all know, vocabulary is critically important, but we need to consider vocabulary not as an end in itself, but rather as a precursor into reading and writing, particularly in the content areas. So tonight we will start with sort of a review of how do we go about selecting and teaching vocabulary, but we want to move into how it connects within reading and writing and how students can learn many more words. So good evening and thank you for having us, uh, Casey. So we'll, as Margarita said, we'll start a little bit with why teach vocabulary. Well, simply because vocabulary is status. It's that significant predictor of reading comprehensions and success in middle schools and beyond. In fact, we can go into a first or second grade classroom and see who will be successful in later grades based on their vocabulary comprehension. This starts with most children coming into the classroom with approximately 8,000 words and they need to learn three to 5,000 more per year to be successful. So there's a way to do that because they have a lot of vocabulary in the content text that they're expected to read and to process. Because, however, many students come into the classroom with a smaller vocabulary than we would prefer, it's really important for us to focus on academic language, especially those tier two vocabulary instruction and processing words that help them access those grade level texts. And we'll talk more about tier one, tier two, and tier three in just a minute. Right. And we developed this framework because we know that there are certain correlations that really make sense. 
we know that vocabulary knowledge correlates with reading comprehension. And reading comprehension correlates with good writing. Reading comprehension and writing with uh, procedural and content knowledge, therefore, the more vocabulary, the more they read, the more they write, and that helps all students acquire the content knowledge that is necessary for academic success. Hmm, come on, machine. <laughs> uh, and uh, the research also tells us that reading comprehension depends on knowing between 90 to 95% of the words in a passage, in a chapter, in a book, in a sentence, and most of all, in a test question. So knowing words means that we need to provide explicit instruction and that students need to produce at least 12 verbal production opportunities in order to begin to own a word. And we'll go over the teaching, how we go about getting students to do these 12 productions right at the beginning of class. So, but we have so many words that we have to teach before they start reading. How do we do that? Well, we suggest that you start by parsing the text the students are about to read. Then you're going to determine how much the students will be reading. You're going to select five words or phrases, because sometimes vocabulary comes together in a phrase that means something specific when they're all bunched together. And you're going to teach that before reading. You're also going to select what kind of sentence structures reading skills that you want them to work with and highlight. And of course, how will you determine what they're learning? You're going to determine what assessments they will need to work with and highlight those as well. So here's some tips for selecting words to teach. Start with the tier three words, which you'll find out in a minute are the subject content words. And you're going to set those aside and teach those in a regular, normal activity, using diagrams, text features, whatever fun activities that you already have set in place. Then you're going to focus on the tier two words or phrases for the pre-teaching. This is the leveling of the, the playing field before reading. And when possible, cluster and use phrases as much as possible. Here's some examples. You can use the words such as, in place of, on the other hand, teach those as whole entities. Finally, the best thing to do is to ask yourself, is this word or phrase critical to the understanding of what students are about to read? So to review a little bit about uh, the tiers, uh, we'll start with tier three. As Sean mentioned, these are the content specific words. These are the words for math concepts, science, uh, uh, social studies. Uh, these words are infrequently used outside of the content classroom, but they're absolutely necessary, aren't they? Especially for uh, passing those tests and uh, meeting all the standards. But we need to focus on Tier 2 more than Tier 3. Tier 2 are those information processing words. These are words that nest the Tier 3 words. They're the ones that are in long sentences, and sometimes the students are thrown off because they don't understand, they don't know those other words. The connectors, the transition words, the polysemous words, the sophisticated words that are in those sentences or words that students are supposed to use for rich discussions that uh, entail more than just a tier three word. We also want to share a lot of words that have to do with specificity in their descriptions because this is what will help them learn the vocabulary and uh, get into the reading a lot faster. And of course, tier one words are those basic words that every second grader knows except the English learners. They may not know those words, so sometimes it's important to figure out what these are and then also teach them. So here's an example of 
academic content specific words, sometimes called technical words. And so we see in the column on the left, the type of tier three words for math. In the middle column, we see the type of tier three words for science. And then of course, for social studies, we have those tier three words that are critically uh, important. But if you take a look at the bottom line, you'll see that power is in math, power in science, and power in social studies. That's a polysemous word. And we like to highlight polysemy as one of the tier two categories. There are numerous categories of tier two words that students need to look at. And, but with polysemous words, you get lots of bang for your bucks. Look at these words here. Polysemous means many meanings. So look at these simple words. Think for just a second, what do these words mean in different categories and different contents? So let's look at the word table just for instance, real quick here. Table could mean table and chairs, could mean table of contents, could mean periodic table or water table in science. We have idiomatic expressions, also tier two words, that, such as table of discussion, or we can do something under the table. And that one itself is kind of fun because it also has two meanings. It can actually be the physical location of something, the cat is under the table, or to do something in secret. Oh, they gave him money under the table. Other tier two words are wonderfully sophisticated and have a lot of specificity. This is what we'd like our students to be able to use. For example, the word say, instead of talk or say, how about some of these words? Would you not like to have your administrator come in or even just have your students on a regular basis use the word pontificate or to declare, or to specify when they're talking instead of just saying, say, say, said, said, talk, talk. These, these are also, as you'll see in the different color in Spanish, these are cognates in many languages. Students know these. Let them use what they know already. This is a great way for them to increase and use the vocabulary they already have. And it, you can use this chart to share with your students because what we want to do is show them that we are serious about learning progressions. And so for instance, at the beginning of the year, let's say September, for cause and effect, the students can use the word because. Yeah, that's fine. For contrasting, they can use or and but. For addition or comparison, and. And for giving examples, for example. That's fine. It's September. But in October, we want to tell the students that they should start using due to. For contrasting, although for addition as well as for giving examples starting with in particular and then comes november in november we tell the students you cannot use september or october words here are your november words as a result in contrast likewise um, and so that, or as many examples as you can give for uh, all the different um, categories of skills and words that you want them to, to use, they need to progress as quickly as possible. And here are some tier one words that create problems for students. Sometimes the problem is spelling because they may see the word tough, toothache, trace, because, but they don't connect it to the actual pronunciation of the word. And you'll hear students saying because once in a while because that's how us Spanish readers read English words. Pronunciation also uh, confuses the students. The homophones, for instance, whether, whether, some, some, 
or there are cases where background knowledge is, um, is not where it should be and uh, students living or coming from deserts may not know what a lawnmower is uh, or a parka and may not know what the scut breaker actually looks like. Sometimes, if you can, uh, look out for the false cognates. For instance, exit, <coughs> there's a word in Spanish that's éxito, but éxito means success. So that could be very confusing as well. But you don't have to worry if you don't know cognates or false cognates, that's fine. But you will run into some of these on occasion. So the goal then with all this wonderful vocabulary that you're working with is to go from vocabulary to discourse, whether it's an oral discourse or written discourse. You can do this by teaching discourse protocols as a whole unit, whole phrase, use table tense, other types of scaffolding and structure, but you need to explicitly teach these discourse protocols and have the students practice them when they practice and have these explicitly taught to them, it makes it easier for them to use them right away. Another example of why vocabulary is important to reading is this example, um, a seventh grade long-term L, uh, read very fluently and uh, he felt that he understood everything that he was reading, but Here's how he actually read this passage. It's called a, oh, uh, it's called a quen's witch. Oh, it's about a quen who was a witch. One gray winter day, the elder quen summoned all her grandchildren to the Castile. Oh, this sentence says that one winter day, the old quen, uh, I don't know what summoned is, but probably means that the grand, the Quinn took all her grandchildren to the Castile. I have been a Fortunado to have lived a long life, she said. Oh, she said that she had been lucky to have lived a long life. But in time, your generation will rule the country. Um, it says that uh, sometime, uh, you know, they forgot to say what time here, but anyway, sometime, your generation will rule the country. You must work persistently to help the people take the land. I don't know what persistently means, but let me read on and I'll come back uh, and see if I can guess. Uh, we will always work hard. Oh, I know what persistently means. You must work hard to help the people take the land. We will always work hard, the children. Rep lied. Oh, the children lied. Rep, repeat. Oh, they lied many times. You must also be faithful. That means nice and good. You must also be nice and good to your brothers and sisters. No matter. Oh, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be nice and good to your brothers and sisters. What said the queen? So this is what the teacher did in that instance, because she was sitting right there with, with the student and me, listening to his comprehension. And so from then on, the teacher selected tier three, tier two, tier one words to pre-teach for students like the one we just heard who need a lot more information and a lot more vocabulary, uh, not just the tier three words that are typically highlighted in textbooks and in bold letters, but also the tier two words that are the ones that really change the meaning for this student. And of course, simple words. It's important to teach tier one words because we don't want students going through life saying which 
uh, not knowing what gray is, when Castile and ruler. So this is one more instance for teaching all three tiers. Sorry about that, Margarita. So yeah. but <laughs> when we work with uh, teachers and administrators, we like to discuss the 12 different components of a well-designed lesson. So as you saw, we start with pre-teaching of vocabulary, and then we move to teacher think aloud. So this is where the teacher highlights structure, text features, special vocabulary, other meanings, and do that, they do that metacognitive thinking. Then we have students do peer reading and peer summarizing, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Teachers also need to be doing some depth of word studies, teach vocabulary during and after reading as well. Have students do class debriefings and discussions through cooperative learning. And we also show the teachers how to make the students work harder. Have them formulate the questions and then challenge their classmates with the answers. All out of, of this is from the text that they have just read and worked with. When they're done with that, they really know the content very well. And then we have them do some reviews just to double check. We have them do pre-writing and drafting, revising and editing in teams so that everyone has support, scaffolding and structure. And they do great jobs of creating content-based writing. And then of course, at the end, we want them to celebrate what they have worked really hard on and we have them do some reading of their final product and any other type of uh, publishing that they want to do. So we'll give examples of uh, some of these, beginning with the pre-teaching vocabulary. We want to teach five or six words before students start to read. And so the seven steps are for pre-teaching before reading. Step number one, the teacher says the word or phrase and asks the students to repeat it three times. For step number two, teacher states the word in context from the text, takes the whole sentence where the word is found and writes it on the PowerPoint. Step number three, the teacher provides a dictionary definition. We don't want to send students to find the dictionary definition. It'll take too long. Step number four, the teacher provides a student-friendly definition or example after reading the dictionary definition so that students really comprehend the word. Step number five, the teacher can highlight one grammatical aspect of the word. Uh, is it in the past tense? Is it a polysemous word? What do we want to highlight for this particular word? Then step number six is perhaps the most important one. This is where the students engage in using the word through a frame. It could be a sentence frame that the teacher provides so that they can uh, ping pong and practice back and forth with a partner for 60 minutes. And then finally, the teacher informs the students how and when to use the word uh, during their reading, during their peer summaries, or at the end of the class period in their exit classes, or perhaps another assignment. So here is an example uh, that you can download, but um, we'd like, I'd like for Sean to give you an example for the little ones uh, because teachers often ask us, what about K1 and 2? Well, this is what we found a pre-K teacher teaching during her pre-teaching of vocabulary. So thanks, Margaret. Yes, yeah, so we work lots of the, the little ones and lower level students. And so we have modified it to some a little bit. We still have them, as you can see, do the word three times. And then the second step is to quote where the teacher took the word from so that the students actually see the word in the piece of text that they're going to read in just a minute. We give them a definition. You can see roar is a loud noise. Then we have them turn to their partner, that's TTYP, and they say at the beginning, 
blank roars. So for example, you can see here we have the wind roars. They would say the wind roars. And then we say a fire engine roars or a lion roars. And any of these others that we have here, there they can use too. Then the students, just so we can check some of their comprehension, if you want to, you can have them say blank does not roar. For example, a tree does not roar, a butterfly does not roar. And then of course also the teacher will do step five, let them, <clears throat> excuse me, let them know where they will see and use the word in the future, in the story, in their summarizing, in their classroom discussions. Now, if you look at this, you'll see between the difference between step five and step seven, we do not do the academic dictionary definition yet. You add that when they're ready. And also the previous step of highlighting a word as a cognate or other meanings, we skip that for right now. We don't want to discuss, give them too much information. If you're a district that does phonics, certainly put that in there and you have a six step uh, process and that's fine. This works really well for our English language learners at low levels. You just use higher vocab different vocabulary, grade level content for our students that are getting there depending on their grade level. It's known as SIFE, students with interrupted formal education do well with this set of practice and uh, pronunciation of the vocabulary. Now, if you follow these with fidelity, you'll see here our nice little graphic here. You do five words per subject area per day. It'll take you 10 minutes per subject. In one day, you'll get roughly 20 to 25 words. In a week, that's about 100 to 125 words. And for you math wizards out there, you'll have the answer right away. In a school year, if you teach roughly 35, 40 weeks in a school year, you meet that magic number that we talked about earlier, that students need to be successful to advance to the next grade level of 3,000 to 5,000 words. Now, you're not gonna explicitly teach all of these words, but you will work with them do, using idiomatic expressions, polysemous words, different meanings across contents, compound words, all kinds of different ways that you access vocabulary and reading comprehension. It's very easy. You and your students will be able to go through it without any problems at all once you practice it. In fact, the students typically will let you know if you skipped a step or two. So here are some things to remember. The teacher talks for one minute for steps number one through five. One minute. And the students practice the word for one minute, which means that it will take two to three minutes for each word. If we're pre-teaching five words, that's 10 minutes. Uh, so 10 to 12 minutes at the beginning of a period, at the beginning of a subject area, is not too bad. It's not too time consuming you need to look out for 100% student participation. Uh, they need to practice talking for those 60 minutes. And this is something you will need to monitor and uh, pay attention to. And also something to remember is that we do not ask them to write or to draw pictures or to guess what a word means during those five steps. Uh, or any of the seven steps. We don't, it, this is not the time to engage the students in, in that type of practice. Uh, writing and further depth of word meaning can come after reading because right, up bef right after teaching five words, the students need to start reading and learning more words. The best way to assess vocabulary is to have the students write in their exit passes a little paragraph, something like this. Uh, write one or two paragraphs summarizing what you learned about uh, math today using as many tier two and tier three words that you have learned. Uh, also use some appropriate connectors, transition words, signal words. Of course, all of this is going to come from memory. 
we don't want open books or open notebooks. They need to know that they will be held accountable for using those words and mastering those words by the end of class. So it's great. So in addition to pre-teaching, which we talked about and showed you a nice way to do that, we also need, if you remember, I said to practice vocabulary, teach vocabulary during reading and after reading. So one, some of the ways you can do this is with teacher think alouds, and you do teacher think alouds or metacognitive modeling about the text features that students are about to read. Why is this text bold? Why is it in the middle? Why is it bigger? Why is it off to the side? Text structures, what's the author's voice? Why is this piece of writing being written? Then we can do some metacognitive thinking about comprehension strategies. Again, if phonics is needed for pronunciation of some of those words, this is a great time to do that. And we'd also want to remember to use sentence structures that they themselves will need to be using when we assess their writing. So we want to make, show them the text and how to use those structures within the text. Here's a couple other teacher think aloud activities for modeling comprehension. You can model self-correction, you can model fluency, fix it or fix up strategies, and even to teach even more words. So there's all kinds of different ways to think aloud, out loud to your students about what you're reading. For immigrant children, newcomers, SIFE, and even long-term males and even some other students, uh, they may not know all the text features. Here are some, but of course there are long lists of examples of these. Um, it's important to point out what is a glossary, what is the purpose of a glossary, the purpose of captions, bullets, hyperlinks. So text features are important to point out. And so is the text structure. What type of structure are we reading today, students? Well, we're going to read a cause and effect text structure. Cause and effect tells us an event or action and the reasons why it happened. And I want you to use a couple of these tier two words. I'm going to pre-teach two of these words because in your uh, exit pass, I want you to use consequently and therefore. So as Margarita said, we need to be working, all have newcomers, low level L's, long-term L's. We wanna help them with their beginning reading as needed. So here's a few things for newcomers or our students with interrupted formal education, some phonics awareness, sound symbol relationships. They may have come from a language that has a different symbol and sound relationship pronunciation. We want to give them some concept of word, of the printed text, help them with sounds. What's blended? What's not? What's a final consonant? What's an opening consonant? Spelling we'll worry about as well, not so much in the beginning, but we do need to work on spelling. And of course, more vocabulary. More vocabulary, more vocabulary, more vocabulary. They need to have as much as possible to be successful. So now that they're all ready to read, you and your students are, have done pre-teaching and they know some new words, here's how we suggest that you do Pre partner reading and partner summarizing of that text that you got the words from. You'll start with part in pairs. Partner A will read the first sentence. Partner B will read the sent second sentence. And it looks like the little paragraph went off the, the slide here, but that's all right. It says at the end of the paragraph, summarize with your partner. So it's sentence A, B, A, B, end of paragraph, summarize. So here we'll see how well this one does. A, B, A, B, A, B, and then again, at the end of this paragraph, you summarize. So you'll do this for about 10 minutes with students. So there's other activities to move forward if we have longer texts, but we have found that partner reading and summarizing it has the highest return for comprehension and digging deep and doing that deep dive into reading. And we also have found that partner reading works well for all learners. It matters not if they're uh, 
English language learners, if they're striving readers, if they're students with special education services, and even the uh, higher level students, the gifted and talented students. Works at all grade levels, and we even have found that it works well at the university level. And I'll let Margarita comment real quick if she'd like to about the university that we work with in Florida. Uh, well, we, we're working with five universities and uh, professors of economics, nursing, um, criminal law, all the different departments are using partner reading and summarization because most of the adults um, coming to universities are not prepared for the type of reading, understanding of that reading, uh, at any level. And so the universities are, are now very much interested in this and it will be expanding to other universities as well. So after they do partner reading, we want the students to formulate questions, not to answer book questions, but to formulate questions. This will get them back into the text. This is the first indication of close reading. We want them to do close reading. We want them to um, find more information in what they read. And so in teams, they're asked to construct a question uh, based on a level of bloom that the teacher assigns. And they write the question on a card with the answer on the back and their team name also on the card. The teacher collects these questions and then uses a cooperative learning strategy to test the questions and the reading. It's called the numbered heads together, where the students number off in their teams from one to four. They listen to the question the teacher selects. They put their heads together, find the answer, but they must make sure that everyone in the team knows the answer and be prepared because the teacher will call a number and they don't know what number she's calling or he's calling and they will need to stand and answer for the whole team. Plus, they also need to use sentence starters, connectors, transition words every time they begin their response. Okay, so we'll pause here or we'll uh interject at different times about assessment. Form and ass assessment is crucial. It's what, we all know this as teachers, informs our instruction. It also will serve as our evidence for administration and for the, ourselves, the teachers, and for our students as to the success of the learning that's going on in the classroom. So we have a few quick ways to collect some data. Yes, the teacher goes around observing and listening to the ping pong of the seven steps. She can check on pronunciation and correctness of usage. And they go into observing, listening, uh, partner reading and summarizing. He can record fluency, this cues, something that needs to be retaught. And of course, the summarizing. Did they use tier two, tier three words from the text? Later, when they do the questions, student formulated questions can be collected and used. And, and analyzed for their writing and the structure and you can also use the uh, exit passes and their summaries. And of course, with their oral discussion for listening and speaking when they're doing the cooperative learning of the numbered heads. So all of that is valid data and is great information for you, the teachers, and for the children to know what they're learning. So, Students have, learned, have done vocabulary, reading, questioned each other. They know the content really well. Now it's time for them to put it on paper to work with the writing process. So here's a question for you. Let's think about the writing press process. What stage or stages do English language learners struggle with and why? Well, the answer is they struggle with all of them. Many learners struggle with all steps of writing, especially L's. That's why we start them out with pre-writing, give them some vocabulary roundtable reviews, let them know they have lots of vocabulary already ready for them for purpose and audience and to brainstorm the topic. 
Then we have them work in teams for drafting. They work on text organization, linguistic complexity, language forms and conventions. We have them do some editing. Again, all in teams. They polish the work. They check for errors. They do all of this themselves as a team for capitalization, spelling, punctuation. That process we call ratiocination. Then they do some revising where they will make the text easier for the reader to understand, to clarify. We have lots of teachers who take this time to use the cut and grow process to quote from the text, to lad, uh, lend credibility to the writing and evidence from the text. And then of course, finally, we want to do that all important celebration of publishing using the final draft, put it up on bulletin boards out in the hallways, read to the entire class the wonderful work that they did as a group or any other way that your classroom uses to celebrate all the nice hard work that you've been doing because they worked hard on it when they get done. One example of ratiocination, and there are many other strategies for editing and revising, but this is one that teachers really like. Uh, we ask uh, the students to box the first word or phrase in every sentence of the text that they have written. And after they finish boxing all the first words, they are to make a list to be cognizant of the types of words that they're using. And uh, this is that big aha moment when they realize they've been repeating the same word over and over. And, uh, or they start the word with uh, their sentence with because, some will even start with and, but the majority starts with the, 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 they, 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 they. And once they see the list, they go back into the, their own uh, written text and change uh, one or two or as many as the teacher requires. Uh, this is a skill that stays with them. Uh, this is a skill that the universities really like because uh, students coming to the universities uh, have not really been taught to write. And so that's one of the strategies. Another strategy there is underlying uh, any words, and so that's, that's just one more. But here's a revising strategy. It's called cut and grow. The students will find a sentence that needs to be followed with evidence. Sometimes they forget to uh, give evidence or they state a claim, but it doesn't have enough information. They um, need to perhaps provide a counterclaim. So it's important to give them an opportunity to cut right under the sentence that needs more evidence, that needs to grow. Then they add a different color paper where, uh, where they can elaborate on their sentences and then tape the rest of their composition onto that color sheet. So as you can see um, the, on the next page, you'll see an example of what this looks like. And uh, the students wrote on the pink, but decided it needed elaboration somewhere in between. So they used a different color paper and um, cut it and made their sentences grow. And you can see the ratiocination there where they boxed all the first words as well, too. So this is a great example. So in order to help our teachers and administrators planning and implement and not forget something along the line with selects, <clears throat> successful learning and integration for students, we've got a couple tools here that we're happy to share with you. They're on our website. We'll talk about how to get to our website at the end of the presentation. But we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have a lesson template here it goes through the 12 components. And then we also have an observation protocol that we call the WISE card or walkthrough of instructional strategies with Excel. And this is for personal self-observation and reflection, peer observation, administrative coaching, instructional tutoring, and uh, professional development 
as a team in your PLCs and your TLCs. So these are great tools. Like I said, they're on the website and that's coming up soon here. Oh, come on, machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just one, one final uh, thought. This program of uh, professional development model was developed under the auspices of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, they funded us for five years to gather empirical evidence, to test it uh, throughout the country, and we had great results in New York, Hawaii, Salt Lake City, many other places. And now we have this other grant, a Title III grant from the Department of Education, where we are also testing it in um, Virginia. So we're very excited about this and we hope you be just excited in uh, using all of these different uh, components that you see here, uh, the 12 components. And um, uh, we now uh, have a few minutes for questions and answers, but before Sean wants to share with you. So here are our, here's our website, Excel, dot com don't forget the hyphen here's a qr code if you prefer to use that if you have a question for me or if you have a question for margarita directly feel free to email us we answer just about everything that comes through or if you have a, just a general excel question implementation come have us come help you then here's our email here as well and also as you can see here, we just started doing Twitter. So we have our own Twitter handle of Calderon Slack, all one word. We'd love to have you follow us. So, well, I, that was, yeah, that, I'm, and I'm unmuted now. So thank you for that. And I really appreciate your presentation. You guys, you guys moved at a great pace and you gave us a lot to think about. I'm going to start with a couple of simple things, if that's okay. But what, what is it that you see that, you know, in laying all this out, you've made it very intuitive and, 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 you know, you make it feel like, you know, as a former reading teacher that I could just pick it up and go right in and do it. Tell me what, what, what does the practitioner struggle with the most in terms of what may seem obvious or I don't want to say easy, but so intuitive. What, what are they, what do you see or what practitioners, what are they struggling with with this model the most? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's classroom management. Uh, some mm. Uh, particularly middle school, high school teachers are reluctant to let the students do their, their uh, partner reading, their summarization, to get up and move, uh, whereas others, they welcome this type of instruction. And so what we are attempting to do now in, in our new studies is to have those teachers that are very creative, are not afraid to let the students move around and even stand up during step six and uh, actually use a ping pong ball. Uh, we have them visit because a lot of teachers need to see that it's okay, that it's going to work. Uh, ironically, uh, university professors are much more open. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting insight. Wow. Yeah. I, I'd like to jump into, I think that part of what we find a lot of times the teachers have, um, of course, they're all pressed for time. You have lots to do. So they need to take a little bit of time and work together in their PLCs, share all these different pieces of how it works and how it can be infused into their lessons. We're not saying you throw anything out. We're saying use some of these strategies to help succeed with your content that you need to process through and some of the other activities and processes that you have to do in the classroom. So getting, getting it infused into the lesson, practicing with it, and of course, like Margarita says, classroom management, and maybe sometimes it's just basically the teacher getting off the stage and let the students do the learning and be in control of the learning. What's so nice about the model, the way you presented it as well, is you've made it so intuitive and, and so organic in terms of it, it really feels like you've taken into consideration the actual busyness that teachers, the busyness of their lives and making sure that what you're, what you're preparing is truly, is truly integrated. Um, let me ask you kind of looking forward because if, you know, people are fans, they're going to follow and they're going to, 
look at your look at your publications and 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 uh, hopefully experiment with this model and communicate with you. What are you What are you two looking at next? What's sort of on the horizon in terms of innovations that you're working on that you're excited about? Uh, we're excited about a whole school approach to this. Uh, more and more, the schools are wanting all their teachers, all their counselors, coordinators, administrators trained on this because principals need to know what are we looking for. And uh, 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 when everyone is doing this, the whole school moves forward very quickly in terms of student academic achievement for all students, not just the English learners. That's exciting. Do you, do you have some takers? Do you think you have some takers that are going to be uh, sort of a full school embrace that will allow you to give you a, a closer look at how that works? Yes, uh, we have uh, Loudoun County, Virginia. Uh, they, they, there are four schools there. Half of their faculty and administrators, all administrators have been trained from the four schools. Half of the, of the teachers in those four schools have been trained uh, in last year. And now in June, the other half of all four schools will be trained uh, because they were so excited in seeing what was happening with just half the faculty that now they're going to have everyone. And then we're starting uh, Stop Stafford County and um, other counties. Uh, yes, Sta yeah, Stafford County. And the interesting thing with Stafford County is they realized they had some special education teachers in the classroom with teachers who were doing, had already been trained in Excel. And the special education teacher says, hey, this, is, this works great for our, our special education students as well. So next year when Stafford is trained, they've asked if they can have their uh, students with instructional needs, their special education teachers come in and, and learn the same strategies as well. So we're, we're really excited about that to show that it, it really works in any language, any content for any level of learning. Yeah, I did wow. Saudi Arabia. They loved it. <laughs> <laughs> they love you guys in Saudi Arabia. That's, that's good to hear. That's, well, tell me, tell us about that. <laughs> What, what, what did you experience there? Um, that um, it, it's a very conservative culture, and yet uh, they were up and running and playing and uh, moving and working in teams. Uh, they had never done that before, uh, and so they, they really enjoyed it, uh, I think, uh, the party. Be, they'll probably want us to come back and do some more things like that. Well, how, how gloriously universal the human mind, especially the young, the, the, the youthful human mind, and, and uh, how placid it can be and the opportunities when you do a few things right. So I, I want to thank both of you for just a great presentation tonight and invite our guests uh, and those, again, who are listening later, because you will get hit later who are folks who are dialing in that uh, please join us each month for these. And uh, really this presentation was extremely helpful and I'm sure that we'll, there'll be, you'll have uh, uh, many opportunities to benefit. If you have uh, sometimes too, if, if you have uh, some folks that are interested in, in, in applying some of this, I'm sure you'll want to, you'll, I'm asking you'll, you'll want to hear from them. I'm assuming, correct? Please. Yes, and we do have an, an institute that's open to everyone. Uh, it will happen here in D.C. In, um, on July 9th, I think, Sean? Yes. Yes, July 9th. Uh, it's a four-day institute. Um, a half, uh, one, one group is in Spanish, the other group is in English. So dual language schools are welcome to come and bring their uh, bilingual faculty or the English can go through the English section portion and the um, Spanish uh, bilingual teachers can go through the Spanish portion. So we like to invite as many people as possible to join us then. It'll be here in DC. 
Well, I'm I'm helping one of uh, one of our my my favorite uh, NEA members uh, find a, a, a dissertation topic, and so if you're listening to this and in uh, anybody and you need a dissertation topic, this is exactly how you make that happen. Uh, Margarita and, and, and Sean, I've, I've chaired 70 dissertations, and I've always encouraged those to connect right with the people doing the work because I bet you'd love to hear a doc student or two that wants to do some work with you. And so it's those opportunities that again this this venue can help us create. So guys, we're at the top of the hour, so we don't want to keep anybody any later than we have to. But thanks so much again, both of you, for your generosity. Best of luck in your work. And uh, for those of you, again, who are dialing in, uh, thank, thanks for dialing in. Brandy Bixler, who is normally on with us, is logging in late. It's actually there's snow where she is in Colorado tonight. I have no idea how that's possible. But uh, she, she texted me a picture of snow. But Brandy, thank you for your leadership with these events to keep it organized. Um, but again, Thank you very much to the both of you for a wonderful presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, Stay in time. Have a great night. Good Take night. care. Good night.